the path to enlightenment that is the title of this short talk today what is the path to enlightenment or getting real knowledge people have searched for this path for a long time and the path is so strange and so unpredictable so unknown to the human mind that people have been struggling to find the path and they are on the path and they have not been able to know which side to go and this has been going on for centuries and centuries all over the world what is this path and what is enlightenment a man once came to the door of an indian swami an indian yogi and he knocked at the door and the indian mystic said who is there there was no answer so the man knocked again and the mystic said who are you why don't you answer there was no answer there was another knock the mystic got angry he says why don't you say who are you then the man answered he said if i knew who i was i wouldn't come to you for enlightenment when we talk of enlightenment we really talk of finding out who we really are if we can find out who we really are it will answer all the other subsidiary questions that we make sound so important and so necessary in understanding spiritual enlightenment enlightenment is when we have the light of knowledge there is no darkness except the darkness of ignorance what we call darkness outside is our lack of appreciation of the role of absence of light as against the presence of light that the absence of light is as necessary to make the experience of light possible as the presence of light therefore darkness and light must take place together in order for each of them to be there if one is taken away the other goes automatically along with it therefore this is not darkness the absence of light outside is not real darkness the real darkness is not to know why light and darkness exist and therefore the real darkness is ignorance not having knowledge and the real light is having knowledge therefore enlightenment is having real knowledge we have found many people all over the world in different societies trying to find real knowledge they are trying to find out what cannot be found by ordinary means of learning they go into the caves and meditate for long times they go into the mountains they try to escape from the world they go on pilgrimages they go to holy places they go to libraries and institutions they travel around the world they attend lectures and seminars and workshops they do everything to find knowledge and yet in the back of their head they are constantly saying i don't want learning i don't want more words i have read enough of them i have learned enough of them i have memorized them i am like a parrot i want real knowledge they are looking for real knowledge about what real knowledge about themselves because if they knew who they were they would get the answers to why they were here what their role was and all the answers to the supplemental questions that arise from the questioner being put on the scene here in this world we tell the story of a famous king in india king janak who wanted real knowledge and he told his secretaries his ministers and advisers that he was in search of real knowledge of who he was why he was in this world was there a god or had we invented one is there a way to find out about the existence of god what's going on what's really happening here what is the purpose of this show who's running this show he wanted real knowledge so the ministers and advisers said oh king you live in a great country this is full of yogis swamis mystics learned people and you have just to hold a big feast a big yagya as they call it 
and all these holy people will come there and you can pick have your pick of real knowledge so the king held a big spiritual and holy feast and invited all the people to come to that feast and so many people in different kind of robes some wearing saffron robes some wearing nothing but ash and dust on their bodies some wearing white robes some wearing strange kinds of turbans and headgear some carrying big books they all landed up and they discussed what they thought was the truth and real knowledge and the king this in disguise incognito walked in their midst and overheard them to find out what they were talking about so that he might pick up some pieces of real knowledge but the king was in for a great shock when he found that they were not sharing any real knowledge with each other they were sharing their ego each one claiming to know more about the uh, about reality than the other each one claiming to know more about the scriptures and the literature and the books and philosophy than the other each one claiming to have the real god in his pocket as if nobody else knew about god and he found that they were so egoistic so full of the haughtiness of the little learning which they called knowledge that if somebody disagreed with them they would get angry and come to blows so the king was mighty disappointed and he said this is no place to find real knowledge saddened by this feast and saddened by this experience he retired to his palace and called his secretaries and ministers and said he was very sad that he could not find any real knowledge the ministers and secretaries advised well king if you want that kind of real knowledge which is beyond learning and beyond books then you must have a much bigger feast we only call the local pandits and the local holy men you must call the people for 7 days have feast for 7 days and send messengers by beat of drum to call people from all over the country so the king agreed and to cut the long story short he had a repetition of the first drama for 7 long days he walked incognito amongst these great personages who claimed to have real knowledge and found they were full of their own ego full of their own bloated notions of what they thought was learning and real knowledge but none of them actually had any knowledge nor did they show any signs of the man of peace compassion and composure which the king expected would be there in a person who knew he who he was therefore he dismissed all of them as merely men of learning but not men of knowledge so disappointed he called the ministers and secretaries again and he said i thought i will find some real enlightenment and knowledge but i have got nothing but ego and learning from these people and the secretaries and ministers advised him well king if that is the kind of knowledge you are looking for nobody will come to your feast to share that knowledge with you the king said but is there somebody who has that knowledge and the ministers and secretary said yes there is one such person we call him a mystic a perfect living master he sits on the bank of the river his name is ashtabakar ashtabakar or the eight waves because he is a hunchback with eight waves on his back and therefore we call him by that name his body may be crooked but his eyes are sharp and he can give you the answers to your questions and perhaps give you real knowledge but he will not come to your feast if you want to call him you better go to him yourself encouraged by this new information the king hastened to the hut of ashtabakar on the river bank and he went to ashtabakar and he said master i come to you for real knowledge will you come to my palace and share with me and my colleagues something about what is real knowledge why are we here in this world what is our role do we have a purpose in life what are we supposed to do why is all this pattern of experience created for us give me some real knowledge and ashtabakar said yes king i will certainly come to you and give you the answers and share knowledge with you so on the appointed day ashtabakar the mystic accompanied by seven or eight of his disciples came to the king's palace and the king had laid out a big reception for him 
The auditorium was full of people, all the nobility, royalty, his relatives, his ministers, advisors, all were sitting in the auditorium and the king had put two chairs on the stage, on the podium, one for the mystic and one for himself. And as Ashtabakkar walked into that hall, into that auditorium, he took off his shoes, as was the custom in India at that time, and he put his shoes aside. So did his disciples take off their shoes and Ashtabakkar walked to the stage set for him. When the people in the audience saw this crooked man, this hunchback, walking to the, aud to the auditorium, they were shocked. They thought some very impressive lecturer would come and give them a talk. So they were a little surprised to see this kind of a person coming to give real knowledge. And they began to laugh and mock and make some jokes on the body of this man. Ashtabakkar went and sat down on his chair. The king sat next to him. And the mystic said, King, what is the price of leather today? And the king, taken aback, said, Master, I invited you here to give us uh, some real knowledge. What is the question of price of leather coming up here? What is the relevance of the price of leather? And the mystic said, Are these not all leather merchants sitting here? And the king said, No. Master, these are my relatives, these are nobility and royalty, my advisors. They are all top elite of this kingdom that I have gathered here to listen to you. The mystic said, well, they look so closely at my body and my skin. I thought maybe they deal in leather and they don't want any more knowledge. Hearing this, the audience thought, well, there was some wit in this man and they kept quiet and began to listen to him. Ashtabakkar, the mystic, asked King Janak, what kind of knowledge he wanted. And King Janak said, I want instant knowledge. Sometimes when I remember this story, I feel Ashtabakkar in a previous incarnation must have been an American, the way he asked for instant knowledge. He said, I do not want the kind of knowledge where you prescribe several months of meditation and studies and then you find some logical reasons for why things are happening here. I want something instantly now. Ashtabakkar said, if you want instant knowledge, then you should be prepared to pay the price for it. The king said, certainly, I am willing to pay any price. My treasury is open, demand, and I will give you whatever you want. Ashtabakkar said, king, I just want three things. If you give me three things, I will give you instant knowledge. But before I give you instant knowledge, will you tell me what an instant means? And the king said, well, every morning I go on horse riding and when I mount the horse, the time I take from putting my foot into the stirrup and jumping up on the saddle, I consider an instant. Ashtabakar said, all right, you give me the price, you give me three things, and I'll give you instant knowledge within the instant you have defined. The king was very pleased and he said, three things, take 10, take 15, 20, whatever you want. And the mystic said, no, I only want three things. Give me your body, give me your wealth and give me your mind. When you have given me these three, I will give you instant knowledge. This was a very strange price tag. But so keen was the king to get instant and real knowledge that he agreed to give his body and his wealth and his mind to the mystic in order to experience instant knowledge. He declared in the presence of all the nobility and royalty that all his wealth and everything that belonged to the kingdom now belonged to Ashtabakkar. His body was at the disposal of the mystic and his mind would function according to the mystic's dictates. When he said that, Ashtabakkar said, Are you sure you've given me these three? And the king said, Certainly. And the mystic said, In that case, this body being mine, I can place it where I like. Why don't you get up from this chair and go and sit on the shoes that I and my disciple left at the door of this auditorium when we entered? 
And the king said, it's a strange request, but certainly the body is his. So wherever he likes, I will go and sit there and place the body there. So as he got up and he walked, there were murmurs in the auditorium again. All the audience said, what kind of game is going on? Is this instant knowledge being shared? A hunchback mystic and a master comes and he's making the king go and sit on the shoes. What kind of knowledge is being shared with us here? And as they were murmuring and making jokes of this thing, the king heard this. He was a little sad, but he thought to himself, these people don't know. They only know my wealth. They only know my jewelry. They only know my kingdom. And therefore, they can't understand what is going on. When this thought came to the king, Ashtabak sitting on the stage, he shouted at him, King Janak, you have no business to think of those treasures and jewelry of yours and palaces. You've already given them to me. All the wealth belongs to me. And the king said, Oh my God, he's right. All this I have given to him already. When he said that in his own mind, the mystic shouted from there, King Janak, you have no business to think what you can think and what you cannot think, even the mind you have given to me. And hearing this, the king took his hands up, caught his head and said, Oh, I can't even think. And as he closed his eyes and caught his head, the mystic gave his attention to the king and the king got enlightenment. Before he could sit on the shoes, Ashtabakar called him back. He said, King Janak, no need to sit on the shoes. Come back and sit on this chair. And he asked him, King Janak, have you got enlightenment? And he said, yes, sir. Are you sure? King Janak said, yes, I am sure. Do you have any questions? He said, I have no questions. He said, do you have any doubts? The king said, I have no doubts. The mystic said, did I give that knowledge to you in an instant? The king said, you gave me in less time than the instant I spoke of. What was it that King Janak got? When he stopped thinking, when nothing belonged to him and everything belonged to the master, when his ego did not come in the way, he saw his own self. And when for that instant he saw his own self within himself, he got real knowledge. Therefore, the path to enlightenment lies within us. The path to enlightenment is the one that takes us to our own real highest self. How many selves do we have that we have to go through this path to find out who our real self is? The mystics explain that there are broadly five categories of experiences which make us feel who we are. And each one of them is like a cover upon the real self. First of all, and very importantly, this physical body covers our conscious self and therefore we start believing and start accepting that the physical body is our self. So long as we keep on believing that the physical body is our self and we do not put attention on the consciousness operating inside, we get deluded and not knowing the reality of our own self, taking the physical body to be the self, we keep on creating more and more relationships outside in this world and we keep on getting entangled in the illusion of this world and never get the answers to our question and remain in darkness. Therefore, the first level or category of covers upon us, which does not let us see our real self, is the physical body and the physical world through which it gets attached to all the things which we call life's experience. And we are trying to find the path while we are troubled by this setup of thinking that we are the physical body and the physical world is our reality and we have to find a path in this setup. The mystics tell us that even if we could overcome this obstacle and consider that the physical body is merely a cover, it is like a cloak, and we could pursue a path that takes us inward towards the consciousness in the body, taking the body to be unreal, even then the next layer which is called the sensory or astral layer of experience, is as unreal as this one. It looks more real in relation to this physical world, but in relation to the reality of the conscious self, it is as unreal as this physical world is. But when people 
in search of the path to enlightenment go within themselves and discover that they have a being and they have a consciousness and they can move about and experience things like they do here indeed much better in greater clarity of sense perceptions they start believing that must be the real self and therefore they get trapped into a new illusion and take that to be the reality and therefore they lose enlightenment by taking another set of illusions to be reality because indeed the second category of covers is the astral or sensory self which consists of the sense perceptions operating without the need of physical organs or physical body but they are not the real self the conscious self operates within that astral or sensory self when some lucky ones pursuing the path of enlightenment of going within cross that hurdle and they go beyond that and they are able to pierce the sensory apparatus and find out that the senses are functioning merely to create a vehicle for input of experience through the senses inside consciousness and that consciousness per se is not the same thing as the vehicle in which the senses are pouring in if they pierce that level they are caught by a third level the third level which we call the causal category or the mental category in which the mind takes over the role of the self and says these thoughts and concepts and ideas and questions and answers must be the real self therefore i have escaped from the illusion of the physical and the astral and sensory and i found out the truth which is the mental and causal realm of experience but the truth is even the mental and causal realm is merely a cover upon consciousness which is using the mental and causal realm to gather thoughts concepts information knowledge memory forecast all these things that are being used by consciousness through the mental process are external to the consciousness itself therefore they are not the true self the truth hides behind that if somebody extremely lucky one in a million is able to see this fallacy and see that what is the cover is being called the self that it is as unreal in relation to reality as the physical body is in relation to reality that this was merely a third cover inside if somebody can pierce that and go within and find consciousness per se then one can say yes i found out my soul i found out my own inner spiritual being i found out who i was and this mind was merely a cover this sensory apparatus this astral body was merely a cover this physical body was merely a cover the path to enlightenment can take a person that far to discover the very nature of one's consciousness and one can say i am now at least close to finding out who i am but again who i am this i is still there this is my soul that's me that's i is still there and that i is discovered to be as much a cover upon consciousness as the mind or the senses or the physical body therefore it is an extremely rare event an extremely unusual thing for a pursuer of truth and enlightenment to pierce all these categories of obstacles and covers including the cover of the spiritual obstacle of iness of individuation to find out that there is something lying beyond this individuation which can take us to the real knowledge of the self that even this feeling that i am a soul is an experience of illusion an experience that is outside of the self the self is the one that is experiencing individuation individuation is not the self the i is not the self the i is an experience of the self that what is the self there have been very very rare cases of people piercing that obstacle because the very questioner ceases the very question and search stops when you have reached the ultimate truth about the i and when the i itself is a cover who is going to tell us that there is something beyond the i that the individuation that the fact that we are feeling 
like one unit of consciousness. Itself is a cover. Very few mystics, very few perfect masters have appeared in this world even to share these thoughts with us and to tell us that the path to enlightenment does not end by finding your soul but goes beyond. Now what is beyond? Supposing we were to drop the I and say there is no I, there is no individual soul and pierce and go into pure consciousness, we would find that the pure consciousness consists of a totality of awareness from which the individuation came into being and the totality of consciousness is hidden behind all these covers and lies as the source of all knowledge, source of all experience and therefore that is the real enlightenment. What would happen if one found totality of consciousness inside? One could say that is the real reality and therefore I found total consciousness. But to find total consciousness separated from all these other experiences is itself an illusion. Because if one could say this is unreal and that is real, that is not total anymore. Therefore finding absolute consciousness even beyond individuation is not the final step for enlightenment. If one wants to have real enlightenment, one finds that consciousness per se creates its totality. From totality creates the individuation and the individual soul. From the individual soul ties up with the mind to create the mental realm of time of beginning, middle and end and from there moves on to sensory perceptions to give depth to the external illusion, gets into a physical body and makes this physical world real and it's the same consciousness all the way. When we discover it's the same consciousness creating all the way, we have to give it a different name to it, a different word for it. These people of enlightenment told us, there has to be a word to describe this power which creates our own self and then develops into experiences of all the illusory selves. They could not find a word, so they left it by saying, it is the word. Hence, St. John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That is the real path to enlightenment. So go within, right up to the word and find out what knowledge is.